Independence Day. Real cowboys and fake Indians walk the hot asphalt of downtown America. Gravel and tar pave the patriotic path of rodeo queen and faceless brass march to the beat, bellowing national pride. The contemporary cavalry hail stripes and medals, but leave no trinkets as they crush our clamshell history with every step. Justice parades, Main Street and wax convertibles and pioneer families on horseback. Tilted stets and shades, sunglasses, sunburn and spurs mark the face of America, red, white and blue. Flags fly high through staggered heat wave and fireworks false star designs. I grew up in a small town in Mendocino County, and they pride themselves, they're all getting all geared up right now for the Independence Day celebration. And um, it's, I guess, the oldest one in California, and that's where that poem comes from. Red Hues and the Blues. In a chamber of grace, voices behind me echoing, a gold flame fluttering, ancient symbols unfamiliar with your absence, shadowed colors of glass, a puddle of tears beneath, between my feet, stunning blue streaks and red hues on angel wings, smeared blood, a thousand ribbons carrying light, Hardwood carved to preserve the story, sanctuary on a hilltop, a trail spoked in four directions, winter day my heart is blue, ageless shadows whisper, organ pipes to the sky, I have no confessions to make other than this loneliness. My hands clasped together, my hands spread and reaching towards sky, a gesture of fleshy wings, a large dark man with smooth hands at the edge of my thought, a chamber of red wilting rose petals, rusted keys rattling behind my back, my blood, books within pages held by many hands, shadows of regret lurking, doors like glass wings flexing, and though I light candles, I could not leave my heart at the altar. A postcard to the beyond, before and after. Silent words shaking as they leave my mouth, my breath. Wind on the aching heart, scent of the departed. Shadow where I once knew warmth. A leaf blower on a street with no trees. Thick glass on the eye cracking, tomorrow just darkness away. Tongue stuttering on the truth, throat swelling with fear, hoofs up the back of my spine, a clattering of latent desire, footsteps not taken, the eye angled away from clear light, late afternoon sun calling me out to it, friends lost in misunderstandings, somewhere someone is gasping at light, for life, no matter how many candles I light, can't counter your darkness. Oak trees that bear no acorns are rooted in your heart. Unseen bells chime the afternoon hour. I have no forgiveness to speak. Earthquake poised, bones and stones to be dislodged. Shoreline waiting on fog. Again, thank you. Again, um, from a small town, neighbors. The blonde-headed boy across the road runs the length of half the field and yells to his mother waiting on her cement steps, they aren't home. Voices shout me to attention when the mother replies, ask the Indians. My father stands on our front porch as I approach the old Ford truck. The boy looks at his mother, then back at us, all stalled. It must be serious. They have come to us in desperation, the last resort. But we don't take time to think all that as the boy crosses asphalt halfway and says that his brother has hurt himself. They need a ride to the hospital. We don't hesitate and haul the family and the mother holding the flesh together of the child who has fallen on a canning jar. The gap is wide and long against the pale, lean chest. The hospital is cleansed with silence. It is strange sitting near these kids who are my neighbors, these frightened strangers who fear my eyes and speak no words. Everyone leafs through long ago magazines. I ask their names. Finally, one answer, answers, another whispers. They don't ask mine. 
I wonder if they know the names of neighbors they don't speak of us with names just the Indians, called the Indians like our mail read Mr. and Mrs. Indian, as in, it's in the Indian's yard, here come the Indians, oh no, the Indians, hey Indian, how Indian? Hey white boy, stretches silence all the way to this square space we share while waiting for the mother or someone, anyone to bring word, would he be okay, would it be long, should I wait, does she want me to, fear me to? Like her anxious children turning their hands, they hold themselves tight until the mother returns with the stitched child. Everyone is relieved on the back roads home to my father, Mr. Indian, waiting on our front porch. We all agree in gladness that he wasn't hurt badly, glad we could help. The children scramble behind their mother for, in silence. She thanks us, offers gas money. We insist it has nothing to do with money. They turn and walk the length of asphalt, asphalt back to their house without asking or speaking our names. The death of um, Elvis is coming up, and I never was an Elvis fan. <laughs> Um, but this poem came out of me. <laughs> Excuse me. I can easily, okay, anniversary. I can easily recall the day Elvis died. Leticia was driving me from work to the dentist in a bright orange Datsun when the DJ told the news. I was curious with her reaction and when she finally said it was terrible getting such news on the way to have your wisdom teeth removed. Leticia was older. Elvis meant something different to her. I was more interested in the surrounding hours, what color they were and what filled them up. Remembering pictures of him bloated and sweating on some glaring stage, an American favorite, American icon, American style. The dentist's job turned out to be more than expected. A jet stream of nitrous oxide dimmed the glare as I tripped on Elvis until called back with instructions to hold my fist firmly beneath my chin so my head wouldn't bounce when he used the bone chisel. My head bounced anyway. He mumbled something about the strength of Indian teeth while he shook his head in some kind of amazement and in the allotted time of two hours he accomplished only half the job. I'd have to return for the same thing on the other side. He stitched me up, sent me home with false laughter in my blood and a bottle of Percodin which made me sick and wasn't enough for Elvis. I spent the next few days with my new lover who tempered my swollen face misery. We talked about Elvis, how my older brother liked him, his older sisters did the Elvis thing, adored the king from jailhouse rock to superstition of the mind. It is 25 years beyond that August and still every year when his death is memorialized on radio and TV, I wonder of those circling hours and the whereabouts of wisdom. It's obviously more than 25 years now. In the house, in the motherlode country south of my homeland, Clouds converge and dissipate, block out the sun, then let it through. The roundhouse smokes, its mud floor molds around my feet, warmed by spirit, fed by fire of madrone. Thank you. Untitled, rusted and gray, rusted and graying wildcat, Elder out so late on a winter's night. What stories have you gathered in the tough leather of your paws, or that are contained in the clear and swollen drop of night's moisture on the end of your silver whisker, reflecting Venus or the hunger moon? On certain nights I have seen it shine from your eye as you dashed in front of my headlight over the e edge of the Eel River Canyon. Does it mean your time is short? Or do you and Venus have a thing going on? <laughs> Salmon flesh beneath moon, a feast is near. That fish in night sky 
going up river, heading home. This acorn time names his journey, calls him back to beginnings, called back to a soft circle belly, flaming red fire, flesh feeding an October night flight of fish ac across a frozen sky with skin of stars. I have seen that same star-colored salmon flickering in another river not named Sky, but not far from here. Several nights back, I stopped at that river, and moon gave streaks cut by fish, splitting a silver ribbon of water, which was, on that particular night, a lean woman body swaying and dancing the river motion beneath moon. <laughs> it's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one time I read this, the poem I'm going to read right now, and there was an elder Indian lady in the audience, and when I got done, she was like, I would have never read that. <laughs> and then I don't know what my mother would say either, but the blue house. Waist-high yellow mustard is blooming and swaying in the afternoon wind on the vacant lot where the whorehouse stood. Its reputation was relatively new, like the odd color of blue paint, though the house itself was old. She knew stories that shadowed it before it became sullied by ill repute. Ethel lived there briefly until her daughter's man choked to death in the middle of one random night. Something caught in his throat while his lover screamed into the endless darkness for any help. Now, yellow mustard are bending and swaying in the city lot where that house once stood. Even school kids had taken to calling at the whorehouse as they ate at the Mexican restaurant across the street, taking note of who went in and out in the revolving door or who got picked up or dropped off anywhere near. They made distinction that it wasn't a drug house, but a whorehouse, even though no one mentioned or knew who the whores were, if there was a madam, or what the price was, or what color painted the inside walls, what those walls witnessed. Then one day it was empty and quiet, almost serene, and everyone wondered what had happened, where they all went. There were no new tenants, no deposits, first and last payments, nothing until a backhoe showed up and clawed through the aged siding, shattering the smeared windows, bringing it all down. Now yellow mustard are swaying gracefully in the vacant space where the whorehouse once stood and no one really cares. No one notices the lean women of green dress and lacy yellow hats dancing there. I would have never read that poem. <laughs> Streets of Mendocino. They weren't cowboy boots, and the heel precisely stacked was more height than I preferred. But the well cured leather shone both strength and suppleness through the streakless glass, luring tourists, which we were not. The boots were the color of a winter river or coffee softened by cream, and the off-season sale made the contoured cowhide even more attractive, just what a shopkeeper's window display was meant to do. To the tourists, we were a rare attraction on the narrow village sidewalks. We couldn't pass for st cigar store Indians decorating the neat row of storefronts that maintain the fishless fishing village. Fog suspended offshore, a violet shadow, a wave of its own, the water shifting, moon pull, the polished hard heel slope from arch to toe, and even though she tried to hide it, the clerk was unaccustomed to our presence, then surprised, gladly accepting our payment. No gold nuggets nor gold coins, but green paper, contemporary currency, legitimate. Seagulls squealed and floated, the tide carved the shoreline, a crash and spray, the yawn. The boots worn to poetry readings, these were boots you would not wear to the mountains. These were inland valley boots, not exactly rain boots, though they fared well over the years. I hadn't worn them in years, but knew of their aloof presence in the closet, box or folded under the bed. Through many storms, relocations, divorce, and basic neglect, they did not fade. The heels still straight and stack, slightly worn on the outer edges, could not recall the rhythm of my stepping and leave no prints on my heart. 
I gather memories breathing distant and faintly of the woven years of past footfalls as I place them in the plastic bag destined for the thrift store. Let us all walk forward. I still have those boots, I couldn't give them up. <laughs> um, I'm gonna just read part of, a, part of something here. Um, even though, I guess there's some, I don't think it's a written rule, but I guess there's some rule about reading things in progress. Yeah, that's what I mean. I've never seen it. I haven't seen the documentation or who, who adopted it. Or, um. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but I, I feel like this is kind of in progress, so I'll read parts, parts of it. Display. There is an Indian sitting in the display window on a street in Mendocino. Halloween has passed, so it isn't a costume. He sits on a wooden chair, his feet crossed, his stiff cowboy boots are empty, his legs are stuffed in denim, his plaid blue shirt buttoned to the top. He has deep black hair wrapped not in braids down, to either, down his either shoulder to near his waist wrapped twice. He looks stoic as Indians do. His face isn't just brown but more than a tint of red. The village lights come on in soft yellow to meet the clouded twilight, a soft yellow, and this Indian is sitting, I don't know why, and he has a black lab at his side, as Indians do. There is a whittled branch staff lying across his lifeless lap, a branch someone took time to create, topped with some animal horn with the points downward and four colors of direction painting in the painted in the round end of the hollowed horn. His hands are of a worker's, and I don't know why that Indian is sitting in the display window in a shop in a high-end tourist town touted as a once fishing village. My boots click first on cement sidewalks, then on wooden planks. Maybe it is like the old times of Indians sitting in storefront windows, red bandana faded around his clay face, furrowed, his brown beaten hands either asking or offering in darkening footsteps at dinner tables and cocktail happy hour beating against the shoreline. A totem pole stands tall behind him, though he looks as though he is not from totem pole country, but it all blends together like Indians do. There must be a story in moist looking marble eyes. Maybe because Thanksgiving is approaching that he is here on the autumn streets of Mendocino with the tide coming back in and the storms layered on the horizon. I still don't know why that Indian is in the display window sitting right below the handmade open sign when the store has long closed for the day and in the adjacent windows are zebras and giraffes that have nothing to do with an Indian looking stoic in a wooden chair in the display window in 2011 or butterfly stained glass or Corinthian bells but I do notice that the liquor flask is a far and safe distance from the Indian sitting in the display window. So she goes back to visit the Indian, but their eyes cannot meet. His shiny round eyes are fixed on the edge of the ocean, crashing at the cliff bottom, across the mouth of the river, the winter stars, the green black tree line against the southern sky. He has no periphery, his hollow clay head expressionless. He doesn't acknowledge her presence. He has survived the post-holiday season and remains now with a small blonde puppy smiling from his lap. He must be effective, accomplishing, achieving results, a shining lure in his silence, a bronze glint through the window. He is working hard like Indians do. I check to see if the Indian is still in the sore front window. I go to gaze into his plastic amber eyes sitting in modern day trading post window, perhaps because it is called a trading post, the proprietor props him up as an attraction, though he is not for sale. I learned that he has a name. He is called Eddie, 
not Eddie Two Chiefs or Eddie Lone Wolf or White Wolf, Two Bears or Snake Eyes or Iron Hawk, but Eddie, derived from Edward, English, I presume, though he does not appear like an Eddie, like one might name a pet. I also learned he is made of paper and plaster of Paris. Oh yes, and some wood, redwood, fir, alder, or spruce, maybe even myrtle, though he seems odd, though it seems odd that a very dark, out of place, stoic, stoic storefront Indian could be partially propped up by a wood called myrtle. I have always felt bad for him. I see that he is tired and worn down like the rabies tag on the small dog around the neck sitting on his lap and the red twine tying and holding his chipped plastered, plastered Paris hands into the shirt cuffs have slipped and are showing the nothingness of his arms while his hands dangle. She tells me where Eddie has come from, a name down the coast that means nothing to me, maybe to Eddie, and that he has been in the store for 20 years and that mine was the first inquiry to which I respond, I can easily believe that and ask his servitude, intending no disrespect, but for one slice of a small moment, Coyote's tail makes a subtle, almost seductive, soft wind on my face, lures me to, the see to seize this moment. Maybe it is now that Eddie should be set free. Maybe I should lock, unlock him from his duties, his empty, hollow stare, and, ride, and he could ride away on a seahorse into the Pacific sunset, arm in the air, his chipped hand dangling by a red plastic cord in what would be a triumphant fist like Indians do on posters or paintings. Thank you, and poor Eddie's still there. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna finish with um, something I wrote I got invited to read at a little coffee house there in Willits um, on a December night when friends were traveling to um, protest the pipeline. And I was being asked almost every day why I wasn't there. And there were many reasons why I wasn't there, but mostly because I work. On the sound of flapping clipper ships, we stand. In the first lapping of the building wave, we stand. In the destructive print of the first step taken by foreign feet, we stand. In the reverberating motion of Ponce de Leon, Cortez and De Soto, we stand. In the determination of Coronado's conquistadors, we still stand. From beneath the pressure of religious leaders, we stand. With corn, beans, squash, and meat brought to Plymouth, we stand. With the introduction of smallpox, we stand. In a circle around the sharpened crown, we stand. On the ship carrying us to be traded for better slaves, we stand. In the fury of King Philip's war, we still stand. In the aftermath of the Pequot massacre called Thanksgiving, we stand. In the bounty placed on his scalp, we stand. In the stiff fold of the Jesuits' robe, we still stand. Within the cold walls of the War Department, we stand. On the El Camino Real and the grass of the Presidio, we stand. In defiance of Thomas Jefferson to exterminate, we stand. In the shadow of St. Clair's defeat, we stand. On the foundation of the agency and outside the fort walls, we still stand. On either side of the St. Lawrence, Ohio, and Mississippi, we stand. In the rattling name of Gatlin, we still stand. On the shores of Huron, Superior, Erie, Ontario, and Michigan, we stand. On the spine of the Great Divide, we stand. On the broken words of 500 treaties, we stand. On the crooked shoulders of Shivington, Sherman, and Jackson, we stand. With Crazy Horse, Red Cloud, Pontiac, we stand. With the wind of Wounded Knee, we stand. With the enduring of Bison, we stand. Through the stampede of the, stampede of the Sooners, we still stand. On the sharp edge of Obsidian, 
we stand. In the red stain of Sand Creek, we stand. With Captain Jack and Chief Joseph, we stand. In the echoing clang of the mission bell, we stand. In the ink of every congressional act, we stand. On the flex of the vanishing bald eagle, we stand. Within the shine of the Black Hills, we stand. On the edge of the Rio Grande, Colorado, Feather, and Yuba, we stand. In the tainted glimmer of the gold rush, we still stand. In the intention of federal intervention on behalf of Indians, we stand. Within the breath of every commissioner on Indian affairs, we stand. Within and without the walls of the Interior Department, we stand. Beyond the muddy trail of tears and gnome cult, we stand. In blood frozen in historical snow, we still stand. On the top of the Statue of Liberty in Mount Rushmore, we stand. In the silhouette of the ghost dance, we stand. On the warped words of every executive order, we still stand. On the Indian Removal and Dawes Act, we still stand. In the hands of Anna May, we stand. On the rocky cliffs of Alcatraz, we stand. Within the gills of salmon struggle, we stand. On the tilted steps of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, we stand. On either side of the Sierra, we stand. On the pavement of Hoover and Orville Dams, we stand. Within the memory of Richard Oakes and John Trudell, we stand. Around the fire of ancient flames, we stand. Within redwood, cedar, oak, and sequoia, we stand. At the edge of the Atlantic and Pacific, we stand. On the skyline of Manhattan, we stand. At the base of the Sundance tree, we stand. Within the circle walls of the roundhouse, we stand. In the texture of acorn mush, we stand. In the stitch of willow, maple, and red bud, we still stand. In the never ratified treaties of California, we stand. With every deliberate intention to be rid of us, we still stand. In the rippling sound of the cry song, we stand. Next to the reorganization, relocation, and self-determination acts, we stand. With mule hoof tracks on our backs, we stand. With every native woman and man incarcerated, we stand. Which with each breath taken in the sweat lodge, we stand. With prayers of thanks and hope, we stand. Within cedar and sage smoke, we stand. Beneath blue sky, sun, moon, and glimmering star wings, we stand. Within the knowledge of the goodness, we stand. With the blessings of each day, we still stand. For the name of humanity, we stand. With rain and snow, we stand. With standing rock, we stand. With our Standing Rock relatives, we stand. <laughs>